Hello and welcome into the Take 10 Podcast. This episode's guests are Nick Ba, Fox Sports College Basketball Analyst, and Big Ten Network Manager of Research, Harold Shelton. Let's get into it. Take a look, listen, and enjoy. Look at here, look at here. With the catch, the finish! Oh my goodness, what a catch! Oh Energy, my goodness. enthusiasm. All right, first guest on the pod this week is Nick Ba. Nick is our first guest in a handful of months here on the, the show. We are uh, waiting for our new studio at the Big Ten Network office to be ready to go. It is now up and running, and with everyone returning to the office kind of this spring and summer, I uh, figured we would pause the pod for a little bit to get ready to uh, record in our new home, and it is ready. So our first guest out of our new digital studio is Nick Ba, and our uh, guest after that is Harold Shelton, who is on most episodes to talk Big Ten basketball, football, news of the day, what have you. So we will toss it over to Nick Ba first. Great discussion with the Nebraska native, uh, former Creighton and Kansas basketball player in college, and now an analyst for Fox FS1, does some games on Big Ten Network as well. It is Take Ten Podcasts interview with Nick Ba. It starts right now. I am very pleased to be joined by Nick Ba, Fox Sports basketball analyst who played for Creighton in Kansas, also has a podcast, the Nick Ba Podcast, and I'm very pleased to welcome him on. Nick, how's it going? Great. Good to, good to be on with you, Alex. Yeah, so I'm getting to know you a little bit, was going through your bio, saw you played at Kansas before Creighton. I always knew of you as a Creighton guy. Uh, first and foremost, as a Illinois guy myself, would you like to apologize for taking Bill Self away when I was 10, 11 years old, breaking our, our hearts down there in Champaign? Well, hold on now. Hold on. I'm not going to apologize because Bill Self left you with a pretty nice parting gift in the likes of Darren Williams, D. Brown, Luther Head, for you guys to make a little run deep in the NCAA tournament. So, so there's going to be no apologies from, from me to, to Illinois fans, although it probably has to be a little frustrating to see the kind of success that Coach Self has had. But it's a pretty dang good team he, he left behind in Champaign. I think Illinois fans are over it, and uh, you're right. That team was unbelievable back in the day. And, and uh, for me, I've always you know kind of liked Bill Self from afar – admired him and he's just like a cool guy cool customer uh do you have any cool or memorable bill self stories where uh you know it's kind of a classic bill self moment from your playing days uh, under him well first of all i think one of the things that's weird about my situation is i actually committed to play for roy williams i had been recruited by roy williams and then roy left to go to north carolina and in came bill self so when i ultimately went to play for coach self I, I wasn't recruited by him. So we really had to kind of get to know each other uh, fast when, when I started to play for Coach Self. And, and it was fantastic. The two, two, of the, two of the better Bill Self stories for me, well, one is just kind of like a testament to his character after, uh, after I graduated. But one of my favorite Bill Self stories is, so we're playing, we're playing Iowa State on a Saturday afternoon and they're, they're pretty good. You know, they got Jake Sullivan. Uh, they, they got Curtis Stinson. They got Jackson Holman, Vroman. They got a bunch of guys that are pretty good. And we're in a, we're in a dog fight. And it's my freshman year. And it was really, you know, I was kind of in and out of the lineup. Didn't play consistently a ton. It was ultimately the reason why I left to transfer to Creighton. But this was during the time of my freshman year where I was kind of our backup point guard in conference play for maybe a three or four game stretch, five game stretch. And, you know, I get in, it's late in the game. Uh, it it might have even been in overtime. And, you know, so I go over to him and he can tell I'm nervous, right? So I, it's, a, it's a free throw. I run over to him and I'm like, hey, coach, coach. Okay, what, are, we, are we trapping the ball screens? What are we doing in the post? Are we going to trap the post? What are we doing? You know, I mean, I have like 65 questions for him in a five-second period. And he looks at me and just says, hey, 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 Nick, Nick, Nick. Just go have fun, bud, all right? And that little, I'm t- I swear to you, Allen Fieldhouse rocking, he didn't answer one of my questions. He just, he knew that I needed to just 
breathe and calm down. And so he had a way of knowing what buttons to push for you kind of psychologically in a moment, because I was really nervous. And he, just that little, hey, 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 he kind of gave me that, that little Bill Self side smile, which got me to calm down, which was nice. And then the thing that's amazing to me is I couldn't believe when I got a letter in the mail back in, this would have been 2017, I believe. And it was an official letter from Bill Self inviting me to his Naismith Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And I, 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 I'm not gonna lie, like initially I thought maybe he, I don't know if he meant to send this to me because ultimately like I transferred away from him. Like there was no ill will between us. Like we're still in touch to this day. He's a guy that I, I talked to on a, on a, you know, we talked a couple times a year. We stayed in, in contact, but just the fact that he invited me to go to, to his Naismith Hall of Fame induction ceremony, it was just incredible to me. Like the, the fact that he could have easily, again, I wasn't recruited by him. He could have tossed me aside. He, did, he didn't necessarily need to kind of embrace me with open arms. He did. I transferred away from his program. He could have tossed me aside, never dealt with me again. Instead, he stayed in contact with me the whole time, uh, followed my career, followed me after I was done playing. And the fact that he invited me to go watch him get in, in, inducted to the Naismith Hall of Fame was pretty cool. So, of course, I went, and it was one of the more enjoyable experiences for me. But that's kind of like a testament to his character. Well, your Bill Self impression was certainly on point. Uh, does that mean you're still like a rock shot guy? Do you claim them when they're playing in the, in the natty? Uh, take some pride in them winning? Or are you, you more of a, a Creighton uh, Blue Jay to this day? Well, I, what's funny is they played each other in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Right. This year. Yeah, Incredible. yeah. So it was a, it was quite a, a a split heart for me. But no, I think uh, obviously when 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 Creighton played Kansas, I was kind of pulling for Creighton. I mean, ultimately the team that you you graduated for and you know got more opportunities to play, you, you kind of you you kind of your heart resides there. But there's no question that any other time. Uh, Kansas is on the floor. I think that's kind of a little bit where my allegiances lie. And, and obviously in the national championship game and throughout the course of, of the season, I was absolutely pulling for, for Kansas and, and, and coach self. All right. So you're a Lincoln guy. Is that right? Correct. On your yes. bio? Okay. Uh, new, new, obviously with the Omaha ties with Creighton and, and that you still, uh, talk a lot of Nebraska on your show. Do you have the trust of, of, uh, Nebraska fans? Would you say having played for Creighton? I know you had family members, play for Nebraska, uh, a lot of crossover there. So would you say Nebraska fans trust you or a little skeptical still? I think they, I think it's been a process to learn to kind of trust me because uh, it certainly was challenging initially in my, in my media career being in a Nebraska market and being a Creighton Blue Jay, which is obviously Nebraska's rival, and then being someone that went to go play at Kansas and, and didn't play at Nebraska. Um, so I think it took a little bit for, for that relationship in terms of Nebraska fans with me to kind of grow. Uh, but I, I think now, I, at least I, I, I can't necessarily speak for them, um, but I think now after being in the media in, in Nebraska and Omaha and, and Lincoln for the better part of 10 years, over 10 years, I certainly think I've, I've earned the trust of the fan base and I think they understand – I'm fair. Uh, I understand the the plight of Nebraska fans and the journey that is Nebraska football, Nebraska basketball. And so, yeah, now I think uh, my relationship with the Nebraska fan base is fantastic. And I think I've started to do more work with with Nebraska basketball uh, on BTN or on Fox, uh, calling games and whatnot. So uh, I'd like to think that being a Lincoln guy and a Nebraskan um it, it is it is in a good spot. It was always crazy to me being a guy that grew up in Lincoln when people would d title me a Husker hater. You know, that, that was always bizarre to me just because you grow up in Lincoln, Nebraska. You know, what I mean, especially Nebraska basketball is like a religion or excuse me, Nebraska football is like a religion around you. Yeah. And just break it down for me, if you could. What is the Nebraska and Creighton rivalry like? Is it like can't stand each other, despise each other? Is it kind of like an uneasy piece? Like, for example, I am a Cubs fan. I don't mind the White Sox. I kind of root for them to do well, uh, but I'm not, you know, not really cheering for them. On the flip side, I hate the Cardinals. So, like, that's my rivalry, you know, as I probably compare it to Nebraska fans hating Iowa. So, yeah, what's the relationship like? I don't really know not being from around there. 
Yeah, it's well, it's it's one that has evolved over the years, it, mainly because I think for a long time Creighton would play the card that Nebraska looked down their nose at Creighton because they were in the Missouri Valley Conference. They they viewed them in a lesser conference. I think Doc Sadler one time notoriously put it as Creighton's the 19th most important game on their schedule behind their 18 conference games, right? Like there was always these little subtle jabs of like, hey, you don't play in the big boy league. And I think that was something that fueled a lot of the Creighton kind of fans and and where a lot of maybe the, the catalyst for some ill will kind of stemmed. Um, so you had one fan base that in Creighton that wanted Nebraska to kind of take them serious and then you had a, a Nebraska fan base who kind of looked down their nose at, at Creighton in some ways just because of they were the little school just down the road. But now that Creighton's in the Big East, and not to mention really over the past you know, 10, 15, 20 years, Creighton has kind of dominated the rivalry. It really feels like, Alex, it's in an inter- interesting place now where a lot of the, the narratives around the rivalry have kind of changed. You know, it's, Creighton's in a big basketball conference in the Big East. Creighton has now enjoyed more, uh, you know, a lot more success on the basketball court than, than Nebraska has. So a lot of the same stuff that would get played uh, isn't necessarily played now. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a rivalry that is constantly evolving. And one thing that makes it interesting now is that Greg McDermott and Fred Hoiberg are friends. They, you know, they're tight. They know each other. Doug McDermott played for Fred at, for the Chicago Bulls. So I think there isn't necessarily that natural animosity there that from head coach to head coach you see in certain rivalries. Uh, it's an interesting rivalry that I think is, that is a very underrated uh, in basketball too. I really appreciate the breakdown. I uh, want to switch gears a little bit into your your background. I know you are obviously very polished at this. You know, I heard you call in games, know about you from from your work. And then I know, you know, on top of that, when I see someone with the professional podcast setup that comes on <laughs> podcast we do, that's just like, you know, it tells me they're legit for sure. So yeah. uh, I know you're not, you know, you're not like Pat Bev just walking into the studio, throwing a mic on and saying, I guess I'll do this media thing for now. No, like what? You want to do this in college. I saw in your, your Creighton bio from 15 years ago that yeah. uh, you were a journalism major. So uh, what led you to Fox Sports? How did you advance in your career? And, and how did you uh, end up on the air calling basketball? Yeah, Alex, for as long as I can remember, and maybe I just had a, a understanding that 6'2 shooters that, can, that play below the rim probably don't have a, a long career in the professional ranks in the NBA. So – As long as I can remember, 14, 15 years old, my dream job was to be a college basketball analyst on TV. Like if I could have done anything in the world, you a genie comes, gives me three wishes. One of the wishes would have been to call games on college basketball games on national TV. So I think when 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 that dream takes a hold of you early on, kind of everything you do has that in mind. Uh, Anytime the TV crews would come and call Kansas games or Creighton games. I always would make sure that I'd go introduce myself, try to build connections, all those kinds of things. Um, and, and then I lucked out right after I graduated from Creighton, I was a graduate assistant for a year and there was a radio analyst spot open for Creighton radio. So I slid in and was able to do radio analyst work for Creighton. And there was also a little like 10 game TV package that was broadcast locally. And so I was able to do local TV for Creighton as well. And so I was able to get reps. Something as you know, like there's whenever I talk to young aspiring broadcasters, the main thing I tell them is like, you got to just do as much as you can. There's no substitute for just repetitions. And so I was able to land into a lot of opportunities to put on a headset and call a game right after I graduated, which Help me out a ton. It's it's one of the things that is so impressive. For instance, about a guy like Robbie Hummel, who is on on, on BTN, that this guy was able to play, retire, and then go straight to big time, high level, nationally televised games and be outstanding. Like that that doesn't happen very often. I was able to kind of work through some kinks and and kind of stink on the air, for lack of a better term. Uh, when, when no one was really watching. And so it's, it's taken me a while to feel like I've settled into my voice and who I am when I'm calling a game. And then ultimately, I always joke around with people and saying that 
Creighton's move to the Big East Conference, nobody benefited from that more than me because that brought Fox Sports 1 into the equation. And then I was able to kind of beg them enough to give me an opportunity. Uh, ultimately, they gave me a chance, you know, and then, you know, one game turned to five, turned to 10 and so on and just build it on and on. And I just finished my, gosh, my eighth season with Fox. And then ultimately Fox's relationship with the Big Ten Network and where I'm located, I'm able to just slide in and, and do some games on, on the Big Ten Network as well. So it's, it's been, a, I've been a guy that is, is incredibly fortunate to have some things shake my way for opportunities to call games, get opportunities at different networks. And, and here I am being able to live out my dream, which is amazing. Yeah. Seeing you obviously on, on our network, you mentioned a lot of Nebraska games. Do you actually, are you in Omaha or Lincoln um, now, you know, living wise? I live in Lincoln now. So I lived in Omaha for almost a decade. And then uh, obviously Lincoln being where I grew up and, and a lot of my, my friends and family are in Lincoln. And when you start to have kids, you, you'll start thinking about who you want them around and all that. So ultimately I made the move back to Lincoln. Gotcha. I was just asking, cause I'd been to Lincoln, you know, multiple times for work, but it hadn't made it to Omaha until uh, college world series last year. We actually were doing something else there, uh, shooting a show with Kenny Bell um, yeah. from Nebraska, but we were there the same days as the world series and didn't even go in the games, but just being around and going to the, the festival outside. It was crazy. Omaha left a great impression. I think it's also because it was right when, all the COVID restrictions were really yeah. lifting everywhere and everything felt like, all right, we're back. Like, this is awesome. So Omaha is, uh, you know, high on my list of underrated spots, you know, maybe for somebody who didn't grow up anywhere near there like myself. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great town. It's a great sports town. It's an event driven town where they will really get behind events that come to Omaha. The college world series has been a staple in that town for a long time. Just had the big 10 baseball tournament there, obviously, uh, you know, and then when NCAA regionals come, uh, to, to Omaha certainly packs out the place. You're preaching the choir. Omaha, Nebraska is a, a great place. All right. And, and no free ads, but I saw on your podcast that Omaha Steaks is a sponsor for you. Like <laughs> that's just ideal, right? Like it's almost, yeah. it's almost, trite, no it's perfect. It's perfect. And, and another sponsor of my podcast is Runza. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you've ever had Runza in your life, yeah. but that is a, that is a Nebraska based kind of fast food chain restaurant. So fantastic. Highly recommend. I have. Uh, I think they shipped it here once actually to the studio. So I didn't have it as fresh as maybe we'd like, but uh, I have experienced it. And I think I've had it on site there as well. So do not sleep on Runza. Uh, shout out to them for sure. Um, all right. I want to stick on Nebraska, but let's talk some Big Ten sports and we'll use Nebraska to kind of bridge our way in there. Um, let's start with the, the season that's kind of you know creeping up on us here with Nebraska football coming up. They're in week zero. Yeah. Going out to Dublin. Um, that'll be a fun one. And it's a pivotal year, as we know, for Nebraska football. Uh, I can't believe it's like year five already in the Scott Frost era. It feels like it makes me feel old because uh, I still worked at BTN at that time and it feels like it's flown by. But uh, just give me your thoughts overall on, on Nebraska football, the stakes of this year, and how you envision it playing out with a team that was entertaining last year, close in a lot of games, but had a lot of issues closing them out. Yeah, that's an understatement. Uh, finished three and nine, but certainly all nine losses felt like could have been wins in a, in a lot of different ways. And yeah, I, I think it's kind of been you know, that that season was a microcosm of what the, the four years have been for Scott Frost, where they've been close, but can't get over the hump. Uh, I think there was a stat I saw last year that it was Nebraska and North Carolina had led the country in, in one score losses over the course of the last four seasons. So that gives you an indication that Scott Frost is right there. He's not getting blown out, but nevertheless, he hasn't been able to get over the hump and, and find a way to, to, to win those sorts of close games. And oftentimes, uh, it's, it's some of the detail things. It's, uh, it's special teams. It's different things uh, like that that have, have held this program back. And it's, it's funny. What's interesting to me, Alex, is we sit here and talk about Nebraska being close, but – They've been a massive shift in their program here, heading into kind of a do or die year for Scott Frost. So, bringing five new coaches, including a new offensive coordinator and play caller, and Mark Whipple. They brought in 15 guys from the transfer portal that are coming in and likely going to be starter impact difference making guys from game number one, right at the quarterback, the running back, the wide receiver. They brought in Oshawn Mathis of TCU, a guy who was 
tops in the Big 12 in sacks two years ago. So he's a guy that they're going to be relying on on the defensive side as well. So it's just interesting when you think about Nebraska being close, you would think they'd want to stay the course. But I think Scott Frost has felt like he's needed to make some pretty big sweeping changes to try to get over the hump. Um, I think he's a guy that still has a lot of support being a, a, a guy from Wood River, Nebraska, a former Nebraskan, a guy that won a national championship. There's still a lot of people here that support him being the head coach, myself included. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be really, really interesting to see how this season goes. Probably going to be in a lot of close games again. And we'll see if a new play caller, new special teams coordinator, new specialists, and a new quarterback can kind of get them over the hump in some of these close games because certainly uh, that's kind of been the, 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 tell, the, the tale for Scott Frost's first four years losing close games. Yeah, and I kind of had a front row seat to the roller coaster of last season kind of in a nutshell. Uh, I just want to tell the story because I still can't believe it kind of happened. Um, I was at the Black Friday game, last game of the year for Nebraska, and was uh, fortunate enough to be on the field. I, we were doing some content with Kenny Bell, who's a hero there. You can't walk down the street without him getting mobbed by fans. Um, I had to leave early. We had to leave the game early. Uh, I had to drop some uh, sponsorship stuff for our, our segment back off at their, their location in Lincoln. So we left, I think, uh, maybe in the third quarter. Things were jumping. It was rowdy there. Like Vibes were at an all-time high. Um, I dropped Kenny back off at our hotel. We're going to watch the rest of the game, you know, right down the street from the stadium. Drive to drop our sponsorship materials off. I couldn't have been gone more than 15, 20 minutes. And I get back. I hadn't even been listening to the game or anything. I assume, you know, Nebraska would close it out. They'd beat Iowa. And I, I see Kenny sitting at uh, the table of this restaurant by himself, pretty down, dejected. And uh, it had gone from 24 to 7 or whatever it was, I think, to a tie game with Iowa driving or however that game played out at the end. But it was such a shift in – the mood, the air out of the balloon and just the entire town, I, I really felt bad because I know how much that means to those fans. I've been on the other side of, you know, my own personal rivalries with whoever in, in any level of sports. And um, it was just tough. I thought that was the, the game. But maybe, uh, you know, maybe, like you said, those results can go the other way. That was just a, a wild experience to, yes. to kind of unfold, especially when I took myself out of the game for what I thought was like, a, a, you know, a blink of an eye. Alex, the amount of times you, you talk to a lot of Husker fans, the amount of times the game ends and you kind of walk away from it and go, how the heck did Nebraska lose that game? You know, we're in the driver's seat, total control. I mean, even the Michigan state game last year, Nebraska totally dominated Michigan state, especially in that second half held Kenneth Walker in check. I think the, the number was about 10 total yards. I want to say Michigan state had 10 total yards in the second half, but late in the game, there was, there was a punt. They were supposed to punt it right, and they punt it left. So the, all, the whole coverage unit is on the right side of the field. Michigan State's able to return the punt. The game ultimately goes in overtime, and Michigan State wins it. So whether it's the Michigan State game, the Iowa game, take your pick. There's a lot of games where it felt like Nebraska had the game in their hands and let it slip away. So certainly uh, certainly, certainly frustrating, to, to say the least. But I will say, even a guy like Casey Thompson, who's probably going to be the starting quarterback, to brag on Nebraska fans for a second. You know, Texas is a, a program that's got some pride and some, some and tradition. And he's talked about how by the end of the season last year, Texas's stadium was not full. You know, like when Kansas upset Texas in Austin, that, that stadium is relatively empty. The one thing you've got to give Nebraska fans, you know, they haven't won a conference championship since 1999. And yet, they are still packing that place out, and the, the excitement and the energy around the program is still high. So I think that's a testament to Nebraska fans, and I think you see that par for the course across the Big Ten. It's one of the things that makes the Big Ten Conference probably the premier conference in all of, of college sports, just the fan bases, the cities, just that relationship with the programs. Yeah, I mean, going into that game 3-8, and eight, it was still packed and still rowdy, so it, it, I saw it. Up close and personal, and it was it was an awesome experience. Yeah. Um, and you know, speaking of like memorable experiences, just wondering, I'll put you on the spot a little bit, but do you have any games that you called that you look back on that were memorable or just wild for whatever reason? Um, and that you know, when you look back at broadcasts that stick out, it comes to mind. Well, uh, I guess the first one that comes to my mind is an unfortunate one where 
I was on the call for the Creighton St. John's game in Madison Square Garden. It was a quarterfinal game in the Big East tournament, March 2020. It was the day after all the other conference tournaments had kind of shut down and canceled, and the Big East was the last one standing. And so I remember feeling in Madison Square Garden calling that game, like you could kind of feel that everyone in the world was watching this game and wondering if it was going to get completed. Obviously, it got canceled at halftime, and we know what ended up happening after that with conference tournaments and the NCAA tournament. Uh, that That's one that – that on a bad note kind of stands out to me. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, as you were talking, that stood out to me was th- this year was the first year that I got to call game. I got to call a game at three pretty historic venues in, in big 10 country for basketball. Did my first game broadcast at assembly hall for Indiana. Incredible. Did my first game uh, at Purdue. I'd heard amazing things about Mackey. Oh my goodness. I mean, that place, anybody that has not gone and actually called a game or been at a game at Purdue, that's as good of a college environment as you could really ever be in. Uh, and then I was able to do Arizona and Illinois on Fox. And I tell you what, Illinois, there wasn't an empty seat. That place was jumping. Arizona ultimately won what was a a great back and forth game, but I walked away from from that game. That was my first real taste of what Illinois basketball was like when I was in the arena, and man, that was was an incredible environment. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Mackey. I'd been there before, but I don't, I hadn't been for a number of years for a Purdue game, and I went for a big game. Actually, they're playing Illinois. It was extremely loud. It's just like the, the acoustics I think with that that tin roof just get yeah. you know get ridiculous. Um, and I remember I actually didn't know you called that game. I don't think because I was at the Heisman Trophy ceremony streaming the game as a you know an Illinois guy and and uh, trying to like listen to their answers, but not really wa- more so watching you guys. And I think uh, Tim Brando was on the call, so I do remember Correct. guys being yeah. on that. But I was uh, I was a little bit distracted, but um, was hanging on you know those late possessions when it was getting super super rowdy in there, like you mentioned. And, and yeah, that's kind of how I remembered it from growing up and going to a lot of those games that it can get extremely, uh, you know, extremely loud and, and reckless in there. So I'm glad that you got to experience that. Uh, and unfortunately it came in a loss to a really good Arizona team. And after I saw that game, I thought Arizona was going all the way. I picked them to, uh, win the national championship. And uh, unfortunately them and Illinois ran into Houston buzzsaw. So. <laughs> yes, they did. Yes, they did. So let's look ahead though. Um, We'll look short term first, actually, because uh, NBA draft is coming up next week. And I don't you mentioned, you know, a few teams that had NBA prospects there, Purdue, Illinois, Indiana. Um, Indiana is actually returning to school with with TJD. But uh, is there anyone you saw maybe uh, Bryce McGowan's as well at Nebraska? Um, anyone you saw that really jumped out and and you recognize as someone that could thrive at the next level as we see them potentially get selected next week uh, and go to the league? Well, the obvious one is Jaden Ivey, of course. I mean, he's a projected top five, top ten pick, depending on what mock draft you look at. But, Alex, I'm not sure if you were ever courtside and saw that dude live and in person. Of all my years playing college basketball, calling college basketball games on TV, I've never seen – he's the best athlete I've seen in college in person. Now, obviously, I I didn't see Blake Griffin live or anything like that, but I'm saying just – being courtside, quick twitch athletes, he's on another planet great. And he's a guy that I think is tailor-made for the NBA and going to have a fantastic career. I think Matt Painter had no choice based on how his strengths lied with his two twin towers in Edie and Travion Williams to make sure he had those guys on the floor. But imagine what a, a situation would look like where he's got a lot of real estate in the paint to go drive and play make. I mean – I think in the NBA with the with the court more spread, he's going to have an incredible career. Uh, Keegan Murray, obviously, it's amazing to think like how many people a year ago were thinking Keegan Murray was going to be a projected top ten pick, but once again, Fran McCaffrey and his player development there in Iowa City is just second to none. The one thing you got to like about Keegan Murray is there's some guys, Alex, that the only way they can get 15, 20 points is you got to call plays for them. You got to run sets for them. You got to you got to manufacture the scoring opportunities for them, and then they can put the ball in the basket. Keegan Murray is one of those dudes that can get twenty 
and he never has to have a play run for him. He runs the floor. He he crashes a glass. He just has a knack for landing into easy baskets, which I think is, is, a, is a great kind of feather in his cap at that next level. Like, I think you just plug him in. He'll run the floor. He'll crash the glass, and he's going to be productive for you. I was on the call for – uh, Ohio State at Nebraska and Malachi Branham just went off in that game. That was as good of an individual performance as I saw all season. Um, and then he kind of, that was kind of the beginning of his upward ascension throughout the, the season. 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, long arms, great shooting stroke. I think he's going to be a good player at the next level. Um, I think EJ Liddell's interesting as well. Another Buckeye that that I think is going to probably be a first round pick. Um, one of those guys blocks a lot of shots for not being super tall. Um, I think he can punish mismatches because of his ability to kind of face you up and, and put it on the deck or post up. Um, Johnny Davis, obviously, his ability to just go create his own shot is something that that you see when you watch the NBA playoffs. you got to have guys that can go win one-on-one situations. Johnny Davis is one of those guys. And then Bryce McGowan's is going to be an interesting prospect because I think he, here's the thing – There are two lenses at which you can kind of judge the NBA draft. You look at players and you look at prospects. When I think of a a player, NBA draft player, I think of a guy that I'm trying to go win a game with today. But when you think of a prospect, you think of tomorrow, next week, down the road. I still file Bryce McGowan's in that prospect where he still needs to put some weight on. He still needs to to tighten up his game a little bit from the standpoint of, of all the little things. But... You, you look at a dude that is long arms, good athlete. Uh, and one thing you like about him is that at one point, if you look at the free throw attempts in all the Big Ten Conference, he finished in the top five or so in free throw attempts. So even as a freshman, slight build, he did a good job drawing contact and getting to the free throw line, which in this analytics world, free throws are a big part of that. He gets fouled. And so you just kind of think to yourself, okay, Bryce McGowan's, Couple, a couple more years of, of maturity, strength training, and then as the kind of the maturity then infiltrates his game as well, he's a guy that I think down the road, maybe not next year, but down the road is going to be a pretty spe- special player as well. Yeah, I mean, Nebraska's probably going to have back-to-back years of the player drafted. That's, that's crazy to say. Um, also, just it's hard to remember, at least since I've been here, you know, six years or so, five, six years, a uh, deeper pool of players going to the, the NBA draft out of the Big Ten. Glad you mentioned Travion Williams there because I think he's got like a unique skill set. Uh, yeah. Just the vision, the passing off the, off the block can can shoot a little bit. And then yeah, you talked about watching Jay Nivey up close. Uh, first time I got to see him this year up close. I uh, probably had the best seat that I had all season for him. Just scores table actually right behind Painter. If you've ever sat by Painter, which I'm sure you have, uh, you know, close up for a game, he is hysterical. Like just his running dialogue with his coaches, his players, maybe the announcers. I don't know. You could you could fill me in on that. But uh, yeah. it, was, it was at Barclays Center, so um, the floor was an NBA floor, and he was getting up and down, just like you said. Uh, and they eventually woke up and beat NC State, I think, after struggling early. But but Jaden Ivey, like end to end, was ridiculous. So uh, I I don't know if you had any Matt Painter stories off that, but uh, I just love sitting behind him because he was uh, a riot. Well, this was the first year, like I said, it's the first year I got to call a game at Mackey. And so it was the first time I got to meet Coach Painter and was able to do it. I did the Purdue Nebraska game, Purdue Michigan game, Purdue Iowa game uh, in Iowa City. So I got to got to know him uh, pretty well. I think it helped. Paul Lusk is an assistant coach for Purdue. Coach Lusk was at Creighton for a couple of years. So I got to know Coach Lusk. So I think Paul Lusk put in the good word for me, like, hey, th- this guy, Nick Ball, you could trust him. So uh, what was cool was at the Iowa shoot around, uh, so, you know, it's 10 a.m., uh, you know, like a February cold morning in, in Iowa City. Coach Painter sat with myself and Kevin Kugler for the entire shoot around. And it was a mixture of hard hitting, in depth discussions about his team and the game and the matchup with also with, with also just relaxed kind of stories, different things with his career. Uh, he is he's. In getting to meet him this year, I've always had the utmost respect for him as a coach. But man, is he a, he's a down to earth, just cool dude as well. So it was fun to, to dip my toe in the Purdue Boilermaker waters and get to know him. Yeah, we have access to all the coaches. Uh, you know, probably the most up close and personal during media days, which came back post COVID last fall. And 
one of the co- questions we would ask the coaches is like, what's your go-to meal you cook? And a lot of them were saying, you know, uh, typical, typical like burgers or right. hot dogs or can't cook at all. Painters, I guess is a big, big chef. Um, he pulled us aside afterwards, pulled out his phone and started scrolling through like his smoker, his grill, everything he's been cooking up, you know, I guess during his downtime. And we literally had to like nudge him out of the room because the next group was coming in. He was so excited about showing us his. That's great. Setup, so that's, that, that's great. No, I've yeah. had great experiences. You know, I think all the coaches in the big 10 are great. They're so uh, coach Izzo is, is a legend. And yet he's one of those guys that's got time for you. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and an awesome guy to talk to. It was cool to get to know Micah Shrewsbury last year uh, at Penn, his first year at Penn state. Really all the guys are uh, Brad Underwood. Um, couldn't have been, couldn't have been, more uh outgoing you know he's intense you know, but but in a good way you know in, in a way that that you know a lot of the great coaches have that intensity so I, I it's it was really really cool it's been fun getting into the big 10 world to get to know these coaches for sure well nick i've taken up a ton of your time i want to lead or leave this conversation with uh one final question here looking ahead to the big 10 basketball season in 22 23 uh i want to look for three teams that could maybe surprise uh, fans heading in with, you know, a, a pleasant surprise and, and maybe being better than expected, or just because of the big 10, so unknown this year, uh, a team that, you know, could be good that we might be uncertain about just because there's so much turnover and I'm uh, seeing, you know, Michigan, Indiana, maybe at the top of some power rankings, but beyond that, a whole lot of unknowns Yeah, two through 14 or maybe even one through 14. So want to hear maybe three teams you got in mind. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It's kind of it feels like a transition year, at least on paper for for the Big Ten Conference. Um, although when you can bring back guys like Trace Jackson Davis and Hunter Dickinson, two of the best players in the country, so you, you'd imagine with those guys in their presence alone, Indiana, and Michigan are going to be fantastic. But if I had to give kind of a couple of surprise teams, let, let's start with with Illinois. To me, they they lose a ton, right? Kofi Coburn, Trent Frazier, Plummer, Corbello, but. Find me two better players in the transfer portal that a team has landed than Matthew Meyer and Terrence Shannon Jr., uh, both guys coming out of the Big 12 Conference. Matthew Meyer has a national championship ring. I think Brad Underwood has been quoted as saying that like he has been where we want to go, and I think that matters. And then also – when you think about Terrence Shannon Jr., I mean, he was at a program that had a winning pedigree as well. So I think if both those guys uh, can come in and, and kind of help gel the rest of the, the the guys that are that are in that locker room, it's a pretty good two two man combination to start with. I think although Illinois loses a lot, they're a team that I think could surprise some people. We talked about Micah Shrewsbury and Penn State. They're a group that they lose John Hara, they lose Sam Sessoms, but Jalen Pickett showed you by the end of the year as the season progressed and he got comfortable in the Big Ten that he is a capable Big Ten guard that can score. Uh, Miles Dredd can shoot it. He's coming back. I love Seth Lundy. I love his competitive spirit. He's got a desire to be great and to win that I think every good team has to have. And Michael Shrewsbury understands the Big Ten and they understand who they are. You look at their Ken Palm numbers, they were top 50 defense, and they were one of the slowest possession teams in terms of tempo in the country. They are going to slow you down. They're going to control pace. They're going to keep you off balance. And I think with Pickett, Lundy, and Dredd, they're a team that can surprise some people. And if you look like they beat they beat some teams last year, uh, some of the teams that were at the top of the conference, so they're capable. And then – I'll throw Wisconsin in there as well, just because you would think you lose Johnny Davis, you lose Brad, you lose Brad Davis, and you're, you're probably maybe going to – I don't know what a lot of Badger fans are thinking. Maybe it's a transition year or a step back kind of a year. I think it's a lot of what some people maybe thought uh, a couple years back. But Tyler Wall, Stephen Crow coming back. So you kind of check that size mark, uh, a size box that you have to have in the Big Ten Conference. And then Chucky Hepburn came in. As a, as a freshman, ran the show, 30 minutes a game, handling the ball, which is not easy to do. And I think he's ready to make a huge leap. You've seen it before with different guys in the Big Ten where they take a big leap from their freshman to sophomore year, like a Johnny Davis. I don't know if it's going to be quite that kind of a leap, but 
I think Chucky Hepburn is about to take a massive step forward and kind of be that next big lead guard for the Badgers. And, uh, and Wisconsin is one of those programs that has earned the benefit of the doubt that they're going to figure it out and they're going to be a factor in the Big Ten race when we get into February and March. So to me, Illinois, Penn State, and Wisconsin are the three teams, to me, that could surprise some people next year. Appreciate the insight there. I know, you know you're not just pandering with the uh, Illinois jersey. <laughs> All good. Um, Nick, uh, appreciate that insight and, and just the discussion overall. Really good stuff. And uh, it got me missing college basketball season. Luckily, we get a taste of it next week with uh, those familiar faces at the NBA draft. So uh, appreciate you jumping on and hope to talk to you uh, pretty soon here down the road. Sounds good, Alex. I appreciate you, man. All right. Thanks once again to Nick for joining the show. Really appreciate him jumping on, taking some time. Uh, it's really nice to meet him for the first time and just talk ball. And uh, the NBA draft coming up this week is a storyline that never really stops. So great to have him on. We also talk uh, a little bit of NBA draft and just summer happenings with Harold Shelton is coming right up. And uh, a lot of the uh, discussion is just catching up with, with H to see him in person. Uh, he's been a part of this process to get our new studio up and running as well and uh, it's been a long time coming so glad to get him in person in our uh, Chicago office to sit down and record this one so definitely look this episode up on YouTube if you're, if you're listening audio only and uh, see the end result we'll toss it over now to Harold Shelton talk some Big Ten summer topics football basketball and anything else on our minds that discussion starts right now all right very pleased to be joined by Harold Shelton. It's been a long way away, but the wait was worth it because we are back and we're in our new home. Harold, welcome into the digital studio, the podcast studio, welcome to the lab. Yeah, this is nice, man. I'm just taking it all in. Like you said, we've, we've done, you know, different configurations of this pod, whether it was Zoom or whether it was like, you know, in a micro studio with a phone, like whatever the case was, but like, being in here, taking it all in, like it's a job well done by everybody. Looking forward to making this the new home. Yeah, man, like you said, it was literally us huddled around a table, uh, I think in the first iteration of the podcast with an iPhone recording everything. We made it work, but this is always kind of the vision. So for those watching on YouTube, um, you can kind of see the setup, right? We got Harold Nye at the desk in the beautiful new digital studio space and got the uh, professional podcast setup. So uh, you feel like this is kind of a uh, an official side hustle for you now, no more playing around? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely down with it. I'm um, looking forward to being in here a lot more, um, especially once football season starts up, we start getting it, getting it going every week. Uh, uh, I'll be very comfortable uh, when that time comes around. Yeah, man, getting it tuned up right now, it's June. Um, and obviously, you know, if anyone has been listening along, it's been a while since we dropped an episode. Uh, with this space being built and other responsibilities shifting, but on a bit of a, a hiatus, but we are back and just want to catch up with you, man. Because like, even though we are coworkers, um, we don't you know talk every day. So want to get to know what you've been up to since I don't know the last couple of months. Like this is always a slow time of year at the network studio. So uh, how is your kind of early summer going now that Big Ten sports are in the rearview mirror? Uh, it's been pretty low key, pretty uh, pretty status quo on my end. Uh, usually, I don't start getting things going until later in the summer. So right now, everything is just kind of simmering at this point. But uh, you know, now that you know sports are over for us, it's more just office projects and then figure out vacation, try to you know get started on that monstrous football packet, and you know got media days and all that stuff. So right now it's simmering, but once we get toward July and August, it'll be fun. Yeah, kind of parallel to this room being built. Everyone's come back to the office at least a little bit, a couple times a week. So it's been good seeing everybody. Um, but alongside that, it's mostly just like the behind the scenes people. So like, I feel like I haven't seen a lot of the on-camera folks, a lot of the TV people. So once the season starts and on the other side of this wall is literally the green room where they all hang out, it'd be nice to see everyone and, and kind of get them, uh, get them used to the studio, get them off the TV set a little bit, get them in here shooting stuff for social media. Uh, I've been giving tours of this room and people kind of ask what it's for and I always give them the, the spiel that it's taking them off TV set, packaging it for social media, for your phone, a little more loose, you know, pop the collar a little bit, take the tie off and uh, kick back and, and just act like you're, uh, you're chopping it up with your friends. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's kind of my preferred method of communication anyway. Uh, just more of a laid back atmosphere. Like you said, we just, you know, kind of kick back, chop it up, um, you know, kind of formal but informal at the same time. That's, that's my speed. So H, what have we missed since, I guess the last time we recorded, I don't have a date off the top of my head, but I feel like it was around when March Madness was going on. Obviously we missed most of the NCAA tournament. Uh, we had talked about maybe the prospects for the Big Ten projecting better. They had a slightly better showing than the year before, but still not, uh, I think, reflective of how the regular season went. Um, beyond that, you know, the next kind of big event that we touch on is the, the NFL draft. We got the NBA draft coming up, which should be, you know, really, really juicy for Big Ten guys. So, uh, and like you said, we're already starting to prep for Big Ten football media day is about six weeks away. So. Uh, any like storylines that you wanted to touch on, but we didn't have the platform to do so, or anything that's interesting from the last few months, um, lay it on me if you got it. I um, mean, we can kind of get into the, the NFL draft a little bit. Obviously, we had some some big name guys go early, um, and just overall, you know, the Big Ten had 48 guys drafted, uh, fifth most in the conference in common draft era, second most in nearly 50 years. So. Um, we saw a very, very competitive football season, and obviously that carried over into the draft. A lot of high-level talent, a lot of middle-round guys, a lot of depth. Um, so it wasn't a surprise to see that we were really good um, on the field and see that carry over into the draft. Um, shout out to Penn State. They actually led the way uh, for the Big Ten in terms of most draft picks. It's usually Ohio State or Michigan, but this year with the Nittany Lions, so I got to give a shout out to them. All right, well, I feel like I got a sleeper in David Bell on my fantasy team. I feel like he was slept on for some reason, you know. I was, it's, it's one of those things, and I feel like I see it more in basketball, that guys who dominate in college or just look next level ready from day one, and then, you know, the, the draft comes along, and, and it could be the nature of that position, the nature of, uh, you know, maybe some of his measurables, but I think he was a fourth-round guy, and uh, seeing him, you know, available uh, in my fantasy league, I had to, I had to scoop him up, because I see already did to, you know, for example, Iowa fans for, the last several years and uh dude's a monster so i don't know if there's any like any sleepers but i'm now a, a fancy team owner that has rondale moore and david bell so i'm just like all in on purdue so you got fantasy leagues already in june so that's the thing i'm in like one super serious one that rolls over it's like dynasty league okay so um that one's been going on for a few years it started right at the beginning of the pandemic and like people make trades all year round it's, it's honestly i'm in over my head but me and my dad kind of <laughs> tag team it he's he's really okay. like the shadow gm behind it um, but I, I traded for Rondale Moore during the draft week, and then I picked up David Bell, so I went all in on Purdue receivers. All right. I mean, it's definitely not a bad strategy, and I, I'm with you on David Bell. I, the tape doesn't lie, and we saw how good he was as soon as he stepped on campus, and he was great no matter who was throwing him the ball, whether he had Rondale Moore with him or not. Dude just put up numbers, and I think – the tape, for whatever reason, kind of gets pushed aside when the combine happens. And because he didn't run as fast or he might not have been as tall, people are like, eh, I don't really know. But I wouldn't be shocked at all if he's a 10-year pro and, you know, helps a team win for sure. I mean, that guy, all he did was get open. All he did was make plays. Biggest games, you know, best opponents. He's a stud. So that's a good pick by you. All right, very much not under the radar guy. I got to get your opinion on... Aiden Hutchinson, you're a Lions fan. Um, very much not a Wolverine fan, being a Michigan State guy. But uh, I gotta for one ask about how you you know you reckon with those two loyalties there, and also what you think about Aiden kind of being the cornerstone of that defense for you know hopefully 10, 15 years for for your sake and for uh, for his sake. So I wanted Thibodeau. Um, I just think that. I feel like Aiden Hutchinson has a higher floor than Thibodeau, but I felt like Thibodeau had a higher ceiling. I still think Aiden Hutchinson will be a really good pro. Um, now that he's a Lion, I can put the Wolverine stuff to the side. You know, it's, we have a, a common goal here. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, I hope he does well. I figured that would be the pick. It makes a lot of sense. Um, Dan Campbell is, you know, a, the hard nose, get it out the mud kind of guy, and, and Hutchinson is known for incredible motors. So uh, the fit definitely, you know, seemed to make a lot of sense. And looking forward to seeing what he looks like on Hard Knocks this summer. Yeah, I forgot about Hard Knocks. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be interesting. Yeah. I mean, Dan Campbell's like 
the poster child for that show. Oh yeah, you know, I, I a lot of kneecaps, a lot of kneecaps. I know the one up. thing that's the one thing that <laughs> cracks me up is when those type of guys are like people who have quirks, we should say. Uh, then when like that type of show comes around, they get mad or they like you know get offended that people are trying to get inside. It's like not that he's gonna do that. I think he'll he'll ham it up. But you know how insular the NFL is, and sometimes I feel like people who are uh, insane, you know, week to week, then try to go on their show when the uh, the cameras crews come around. So yeah, I, Dan Campbell strikes me as a guy that he's gonna be his authentic self no matter what the situation is. I hope that holds true for this show. But you're absolutely right. Like you could tell there are certain guys when the cameras are around and they act totally different than when they aren't around. So uh, I hope that's not the case. Um, I know a lot of people have a lot of opinions on Dan Campbell. Um, especially from the outside perspective. So I'm curious just to kind of see how it plays out, you know, in August. And, you know, the Lions don't usually get a lot of national attention. You know, it's usually just the Thanksgiving game or their struggles from year to year or decade to decade. But, uh, you know, hopefully this will be a positive. And your Lions will probably be battling it out with my Bears for the bottom of the NFC North, you know, probably be top, near the top of the draft next season. Aaron Rodgers decided to hang around and uh, torment us for another year. So, uh, not too not too thrilled about that. And I don't think the Vikings are anything special either. So, uh, as good as Big Ten football is uh, around this region of the country, the NFL, uh, it's been a struggle lately, especially for for your squad. But uh, I don't know. The blueprint's kind of there for a team to get out of the basement. The, the Browns sort of did it for a couple years, at least were relevant, um, and they were kind of the lions on that on that level. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think you guys are at least, like you said, more of a media darling now. Uh, with some likable guys. I also, speaking of that fantasy team, Jamison Williams, man, he's, he's on my squad as well. So you guys got some exciting uh, burst on the squad for sure. Yeah, I think they're doing it right too. Uh, I, you know, this the old adage, you gotta win up front. It doesn't matter if it's college or pro. And, you know, they've already got a pretty good offensive line. You drive Hutchinson to help with that defensive line. You, now you're starting to get some weapons for the quarterback, whether it happens to be golf or somebody down the line, maybe CJ Stroud. No, we'll see what happens, but uh, no, I think for once, like there's a plan in place and you could see it and you just hope it plays out. For the record, I'm still very much a Justin Fields believer. Um, I don't care what the haters say. I think he was just put in a oh, terrible yeah, position absolutely. last year. I, like, I'm surprised, honestly, at the amount of doubt there is out there. It's like one year of coaching and management and competence and not much help. Yeah, they didn't put him in a him. position to succeed at all. Let the man cook a little bit. Yeah. Let's, let's give him some time. I don't know why it has to be like right away that I think Mahomes kind of spoiled people with, with that instant success, but uh, he's still sat. Yeah. Keep exactly. Yeah. I want I want uh, this on the record that Fields I think will still have a great career, and I I, I really hope I'm correct because uh, I just want to see one good quarterback in my professional team in my lifetime. So fingers crossed. Um, let's. Shift gears to the other pro sport um, going on right now that has some Big Ten ties and it's kind of just commanding all of our, our eyeballs right now, and that's the NBA Finals. Are you watching? Are you invested? Your guy Draymond is there. Your guy Tom Izzo is there in person taking it in. Uh, any overarching thoughts outside of the fact that Draymond is just a, a maniac? Like he's, he's lost his mind on the court, but it's, it's like super effective. Um, I don't know, I don't know what you're, where you come at it, but... Uh, just one of those things it's like you can't look away. I completely understand if people don't like the Warriors or if they don't like Draymond. Like, I completely get it. I, I understand it. He can be over the top. It could be overbearing. But I don't think Golden State is where they are without him. I don't think they, want, they win the titles that they did without him. Uh, he clearly serves a purpose. He's the agitator. He's the, the soul of that, that defense. He allows them to switch everything. And so, you know, obviously as a Michigan State guy, I'm rooting for him to do well. I completely understand, again, if people don't, but that's my guy. I'm a ride with him. Uh, so, you know, hopefully the Warriors win. Um, it's been a fun finals. The playoffs haven't been so, at least the conference finals weren't so great. So I'm hoping that this is an epic finals. Kind of seems like it could be. Uh, I think the, te the teams are pretty evenly matched, and so, uh, you know, we'll see what happens, but <clears throat> hopefully he gets that fourth ring. 
Yeah, we're gonna be dating ourselves a little bit. Uh, we're, we're recording this a little earlier than uh, when the pod's gonna drop, so we'll be a little deeper into the series at that point. But I think one thing that's that's been interesting and that will hold true is that Jordan Poole, um, I think, is a guy who really kind of bet on himself and really like is shining in a way similar to what he did at school. Like it's kind of a, a natural progression for him. You know, some guys are completely different in the pros. Some guys either blossom in their personality or in their game in ways that you didn't really expect in college but he's been somebody who was always kind of a magnetic uh figure in college and was full of personality and when he left i thought it might have been a year early or wasn't sure that his game translated but he's been a great 3 and d guy's really exploded on the scene and his just overall you know magnetism i feel like is completely carried over from college so i think that's just like an interesting kind of big 10 story and and uh He's, you know, definitely a success story when it comes to betting on yourself and, and taking the jump. Yeah, I think he could be the potential bridge, uh, like after the Steph and Clay era end. Like maybe he can be the guy that you know winds up leading them still in contention. Um, it's kind of a nice luxury to have. Like when you you figure Steph and Clay and Draymond will be your guys, but now Poole has kind of become. You know that third score in some cases the second score with clay struggling here a little bit um i'm with you i thought he was uh <clears throat> left the year too early but he he surprised me i mean he was a what second team all g league a year ago and now like he's a pivotal player on a potential nba champion um you know complete kudos to him right system right fit completely bought in and he's doing his thing. For sure. Duncan Robinson, another guy. I know they lost in the conference finals, but like, I know he fell off a little bit at the end of the year. But got like, paid, though. Getting, got paid and got, got paid. and got in a system that was like perfect for him. Heat mm-hmm. culture, he, that's proven system that develops players. And um, like you said, worked out for him as well. And it's just crazy to me how Miami has him from D3 Williams and then Max Struess, who's like even had a better you know season than uh has, has maintained that level of play uh from not only DePaul but uh D3 Lewis here in Illinois it's like how do you have two D3 players on on one squad and, and they're actually contributors it's it's crazy it's great scouting and like you said yeah. heat culture I mean they are very specific about everything like I saw the story the other day where Kyle Lowry's body fat was too high and they were they were not happy about that like they are very specific in terms of how they want their players to be how in shape they need to be you know, I think the scouting department obviously is great. Um, you know, they, they draft really well, as we've seen. They sign guys well. So it's not <clears throat> not a surprise that the Heat, you know, got back to the conference finals after being in the finals just a couple years ago. Just out of curiosity, you know, speaking of like Pat Riley, um, did you watch the HBO series Winning oh, Time yeah, at all? Love it. Oh, love I should have asked you before we hopped love on here because we could have had a whole segment devoted. But it was, it was so good, I thought. Uh, even though they took some liberties with like some of the a lot of liberties, yeah, some of the <laughs> some of the and I, and a lot of them I didn't even know like necessarily like I knew the general outline but I had to kind of go back and Google after each episode like what was exactly true and what wasn't. Uh, but man, that was just like a compelling series, season one I should say of a series because it's coming back. Uh, just a lot of fun to watch for sure. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, you know, as a, a basketball guy. You know, I kind of knew bits and pieces of it. Obviously, it was a little before my time, but, you know, obviously I, I followed Magic, you know, even, you know, as a kid. And so, like, I would hear the stories of, you know, game six against the Sixers and him sitting in Kareem's seat on the plane and then him getting, you know, 42, 15, and seven as a rookie. Like, you know, stuff you just would never think would happen at that time. And so, um, I thought they didn't necessarily need to take all the liberties that they did right. to make them seem like they struggled as much as they did because from everything that I've read and, and heard that they pretty much just rolled even though it was Paul Westhead as coach and not the original guy and you know they didn't need to make it seem like oh man if they don't win here he's going to get fired and all that stuff like I think it's cool you get pretty much an interim guy come in and they're off to the races and it's you know there's no issue and they pretty much cruise to the to to the title yeah and what's interesting is uh with with that series also i got i got a shout out a lot of michigan state representation uh in the series i'm sure that was an extra 
added bonus for you. Um, also, we got the logo behind you. Set design is on point around here. Uh, I got my, well, actually, this is Emily Eamon's uh, Illini jersey, but uh, fits, the, fits the alma mater representation we got going here. But um, not only in that, that series, but Don't Look Up as well. That took place in Michigan State. I feel like just pop culture is gravitating around uh, East Lansing right now. Hey, not mad at it. I love it. I, I should love say, it. What, my original point, though, I want to get back to it, is um, what's interesting about Winning Time is that there are like really famous and well-known actors that are playing kind of the ancillary characters, right? Like Jason Segel, Adrian Brody, like they're all important characters, but not the main characters. And then the like Magic Johnson's relative unknown. Uh, a lot of these guys, uh, the Kareem actor and, and the Larry Bird, they're all kind of relative unknown actors. So it's like the main, you know, a lot of the main guys are, and main actors and actresses um, are not, not as well known. And then the more famous people are kind of outside the mold a little bit. Yeah, that is an interesting angle. And uh... No, I would put Wood Harris in that category mm -hmm. for you as well. I think he did an incredible job playing Spencer Haywood. Uh, but you're right. Like, um, I know Spencer Haywood actually did a podcast with the two uh, main actors and kind of went, yeah, interesting. and kind of went through the the whole thing. And you know, do they actually talk with you know Magic or Kareem and trying to maybe? I heard that was way up. like exaggerated. Like, I heard Kareem didn't even really mess with Spencer Haywood at all. Like, and even though it was portrayed like they had a friendship. In the show. Yeah, I, I've heard like bits and pieces, again, the liberties in terms of what was, was taken and stuff, but um, like I heard Magic and Kareem, like they were cool, but not like besties, you know, that kind of thing. And, yeah. You know, I think the show kind of really made it seem like, you know, Magic and Kareem like had this big bond and maybe it was just because of, you know, them winning and they knew they needed each other to do it. Uh, but I don't know how strong exactly that relationship was, like off the court. But uh, those those two actors I thought were great, and you know, one of the the guy who plays Magic is actually from Muskegon, Michigan. Really? I yeah. Know that. So there's another uh, state of Michigan tie there. Um, and again, the the Magic at TV, they were saying that he he was actually a football player, mm -hmm. um, and he's only like six four, right. six five. Like yeah. you're trying to play a six nine guy, so they had to you know, do some creative editing and stuff like that. But yeah, I love the series. Uh, wife was hooked too, so yeah. it was great. Yeah, the, the one last character I should mention, I think John C. Riley is really good. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and he's, yeah. he's a big star playing a main character. So like yeah. that kind of, you know, fits the traditional mold of mm -hmm. major star playing major character. Yeah. Uh, all right, went off on a tangent there, but um, want to get back to it. Uh, before wrapping up, it's interesting how the NBA can have like, these kind of concurrent storylines, right? Like their season is still going on. It's, their, it's the pinnacle of their season with the finals going on, but the draft is coming right up. And they just do such a great job of owning the calendar and owning multiple storylines and just making the soap opera of, of the league so important. Um, and that's kind of where we come in a little more, you know, with especially this year with a high volume of prospects projected to be drafted. Four guys can go in the lottery, probably not five, but maybe, you know, four, five first round guys potentially. Um, and how many, you know, potentially even drafted him? You get into guys like EJ Liddell, Kofi Coburn, some of these maybe guys who might be second round, um, Bryce, six Bryce, to eight Bryce guys. McGowan's. Yeah, yeah, McGowan's in there as well. Um, I mean, this is just an exciting year to be, uh, a, if you're an NBA and college fan, or if you're a college fan who needs a reason to get back in the NBA. Like I saw so many Illinois fans in the last year, like comment how they were watching the NBA for the first time in a while because I was on the Bulls and like it was just such a natural tie-in. Um, I think those investments are, we've talked about it on here before, just like those fan investments are legitimate, they're real and, and um, it's a reason why we continue to follow these guys and cover them like we do even after they've moved on from college. So uh, anything you got your eye on just with this draft coming up, it, it's on the 23rd so this will drop a little before then but uh, I'm just fired up to, to see where these guys land yeah it looks like uh, the Pistons are gonna get one of them yeah uh, you know them fall into to the fifth pick I wouldn't be shocked if it was a, a Jaden Ivey or Keegan Murray there uh, guy sat in your seat like two weeks ago Keegan Murray was in here sitting right there uh, first I think athlete we've had in this new digital studio and definitely uh, the first like or maybe I don't want to say first top 10 pick in the digital studio, uh, you know, since we've had athletes in here at all, but 
hopefully it's not the only one because uh, we want to get get some more VIPs in here. But that was pretty cool to have somebody who is, uh, you know, about to go maybe to your, your Pistons, probably go top five uh, in the building. Yeah, that is awesome. And, you know, I think his story is just pretty crazy. The fact that, you know, he was you know pretty much a six man last year. All of the focus was on Luca and Wee's camp and he just kind of did his thing in the background and you can tell like, oh, this guy's gonna be pretty good. And I remember joking around with a couple coworkers like, you know, I want a lot of stock in Keegan Murray. I want a lot of stock in Jaden Ivey. Like, you know, just, and we would kind of find those receipts from 2021 when we said it, you know, as they're blowing up in February and January and stuff like that. So it's cool to see, you know, Keegan Murray, I mean, he'll probably be the first top 10 pick from Iowa since 1980. You know, Ronnie Lester, you got to go all the way back. Yeah. Uh, Jay Nivey, probably first top 10 pick from producing's Big Dog. Like, it's going to be a historic draft. You know, that we'll probably have three top 10 picks, assuming Johnny Davis still gets to 10. I've seen him anywhere from like 9 to 11. So if he's top 10 as well, like, you got to go back to, you know, almost a decade with Oladipo and Burke and Zeller. And so it was a really, really fun year. Uh, watching the Big Ten, it's a lot of high-level guys at a lot of different positions. You know, normally it's just a lot of bigs, but we had some good wings with Malachi Branham, with Bryce McGowan's, with Key Murray. Um, like you said, I think EJ Liddell will be, you know, late first, early second guy. Hmm. And then some of the guys who were kind of on the fence about, you know, staying or going and wound up leaving. Like I wouldn't be shocked if Matt Christie. You know, got a, a second round selection. I wouldn't be shocked if Caleb Houston or Musa Diabate, Diabate yeah. wound up getting picked. And even if they don't get picked, I could see them, you know, making a summer league roster and then turning that into, you know, a fall camp roster and actually making a team. So we, we got a chance to see a lot of talent over these last couple of years. And I think we'll see a lot of those names get called uh, late June, but that, Will kind of affect our season going forward for 22-23 as well. How about Johnny Davis getting a Taco Bell commercial? You see that? I saw that. I Which was, was like already, huh? Yeah, and like I, you know, I don't know how they chose him. Like he, he's obviously a fresh-looking dude. Like yeah. pulled off. I think it was like the purple suit to fit the Taco Bell mm. look a little bit. But it was just a funny, like random thing. Like I, I wouldn't have paired those two together you know in my head but like i don't know it's interesting i don't think we've seen like a uh a major commercial campaign around uh, a big 10 player before they got drafted yeah and like i know obviously he was incredible and but i never like saw his personality really like he was not more, that much right no. he was more of like a quiet guy just kind of went about his business and just you know drop buckets on you and, and which is kind of the joke of the commercial because i don't think he says a word in it right. you know he just kind of like gets his food and gets drafted but uh, I just thought that was funny. But it's interesting, yeah. too, like, I mean, we had Jaron go number two a few years ago. Uh, four. Four. I say, yeah, yeah the Memphis, to the Grizzlies. Yeah. Uh, so top five. And, yeah. But I feel like there's more hype this year around Jaden Ivey. Like, he, I think, let's be honest, by nature of him, like, resembling John Morant, like, and his game resembling John Morant, right. John Morant like, that has been kind of a recurring meme throughout the uh, last season or two. So it's just very interesting that, you know, we have somebody with a lot of hype coming in and uh, I don't know, somebody who can kind of captivate the audience outside of Big Ten basketball. Yeah, agreed. Because I feel like normally in this league, you get guys and they'll stay in the league, but they might not necessarily be like, oh, he's so dynamic. Mm -hmm. I love watching him play, but I know he's going to help my team win. Like now I think this year you're going to get both. And that'll be a lot of fun to see, you know, them go forward, you know, two, three years down the line. You know, if Ivy's dropping 20 something and putting up, you know, highlight real plays and Keegan Murray just kind of continuing, you know, the incredible season he had from the year before, you know, say Johnny Davis goes to San Antonio or something, already a winning culture, and he just steps right in and, you know, takes off and helps them get back in, in the playoffs and helps them become a contender. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if any of those things happen. Yeah, and you mentioned how these departures will definitely impact next season. Um, it's interesting, Andy Katz, he likes staying in the social media streets, you know, putting out regular rankings, reacting to all the news in real time. And there's plenty of college basketball news these days. I mean, portal is chaos, draft deadline has impacted things, and now we know who's going, who's staying. I just thought it was interesting, he said, 
Michigan State was number two. I, uh, we posted it today, and he had them number two in his preseason power rankings. I wonder if you agreed. I thought it was a little high. I think Michigan has probably the better outlook going into the next season just by the nature of having Hunter Dickinson. But they had him two ahead of Illinois, right behind Indiana, who was uh, his number one predicted in the standings going into the next season. So I um, just want to know your overall thoughts there. Are you as high on your guys as he is? Um, and what do you think like a relatively, I would say, majority unknown Big Ten basketball landscape looks like next year? Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Um, I definitely thought two was a little high, just kind of, you know, I didn't dig deep into it when I saw it, but I definitely, you know, raised my eyebrows like two, really interesting. Okay. I mean, I hope they're, <laughs> they're there too. Uh, that would mean that a lot of things went well. Um, I think, you know, losing Christie, losing Gabe, losing Bingham, I think, and they didn't really replace them with a bunch of known commodities like they didn't hit the portal marble's hard. gone like, too right yeah marble yeah. transferred yeah. out so you know in you know east lansing circles and michigan state message boards and stuff there's been some hand wringing about uh the lack of activity and you know they seem to be holding a lot of scholarships you know they might only have nine or ten guys ready to go um and you know, I think that might not necessarily be a bad thing because I think there are times a year or two ago where he would play 11 or 12 guys and it's like, dude, like find a rotation. Like, you know, why are you taking this guy out or why is this guy playing? And so I guess when you don't have as many options, you kind of force to play your best seven, your best eight. And it looks like that's going to wind up happening this year. I do think Jay Nakins is going to be a monster. Mm -hmm. I think he's going to be an absolute star. And... You know, with Max gone, he kind of has to be. You know, I think, uh, you know, Hogarth and Walker will be good, but they need, like, a dynamic score, and I think Aikens kind of has that profile. Yeah, it seems like Purdue and Michigan State are both in kind of trust-the-process mode for losing a yep. uh, chunk of the rotation. So that would be interesting. Like, Illinois really intrigues me beyond my affiliation and uh, being a, an alum of that school just because, like, they won the Big Ten last year, or tied for first, and – now have such a new roster but it's all like highly touted guys pretty much like whether it's a uh, incoming freshman with St sky clark or like proven d1 transfers and uh yeah terrence shannon matthew mayer was like a surprise that i didn't even really yeah, know he was considering at all. illinois and it's a guy you remember from that championship team and is very prominent kind of a, a character right in in college basketball so it'll be interesting and then indiana like i understand why on paper you put them number one or why cats would put them number one I don't think I would just because they were still a uh, first four out or first four in team last year, last four in, I should say. Um, and obviously TJD is a beast and it'll be another year. Mike Woodson, they, they were good. Xavier Johnson is very solid. So like, I see it, but at the same time, it's like, can they get from first four to top of the big 10? Maybe by attrition they do. Or maybe they, they take a leap, but it's tough because like a lot of these Indiana teams, even though last year's version was better, all kind of resembled one another in certain ways. So uh, we'll see if they can kind of detach from uh, that anchor a little bit and, and, and make a leap. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I think you kind of have to put them there, even though you don't feel great about it. Yeah. Because I think it's just more of the attrition, like you said. Uh, there just wasn't a clear cut. Like, if, if Michigan had, you know, Houston or Diabate yep. come back, I think they're one. If both of them come back, they're definitely one. Mm -hmm. um, but since they both leave, and Frankie along Collins with e left Frankie too. Collins, yeah. Eli Brooks graduated. Yep. So, you know, they got some talented guys coming in, but you still never know. Um, like you said, Michigan State and Purdue both should take a little step back, but it's still trust the process, so it'll still be pretty good. Illinois, just a lot of turnover. You lose you lose Kofi, you lose Carbello. I see Grandison's in the portal, but then you bring in a bunch of guys. So they should still be good again, but don't really know. And I just wonder if Andy just went with, okay, I know this Indiana team. I know TJD. I know they're going to play defense under Mike Woodson. Now's the time with – you know, Trace, you know, kind of stepping into his last year. Now's the time for them to do something. I think it's more of a little column A, column B. All right, before we bounce here, let's get into quick Big Ten football takes. Um, I seem like, it seems like, at least from the outside looking in, 
the vibes are high with Mel Tucker. Um, I feel like people are, are hyped for year three. And I'm sure Michigan fans are, you know, just as excited, if not, if not more. I mean, that back and forth is, is, seems like turned up as high as ever. Um, Wolverines come off a Big Ten title. Ohio State should be extremely talented again. They have a Heisman finalist coming back, a quarterback. And they're probably not too happy about, uh, you know, getting knocked off that pedestal last season. So who you got? One, potentially winning the Big Ten. Can the West challenge the East at all? Because I'm naming all Big Ten East teams, even though those divisions are going away uh, in time here. Penn State, are they coming back? And who is, like, maybe the, the dark horse? I realize I'm lobbying, like, five questions at you at a time here, but... Let's just kind of roll through some of these, these talking points. Uh, and I know, I'm sure Nebraska fans uh, are excited, you know, just because of the high stakes nature of this season. Like last year was exciting. It was not uh, fruitful for them because they were three and nine or whatever, but like every game was, was wild. And they have an Oklahoma coming to town pretty soon, in a few months here. Um, it's, a, it's a really crucial season for the head guy there, Scott Frost. So. I'm just rattling off storylines. Please respond. <laughs> uh, so I, I can give you a, a June preview. Yeah. Obviously, I think things could change between now and August. But um, I think Ohio State is the clear favorite. Um, I know what Michigan did last year. I respect what Michigan did last year. Uh, they finally got over that Ohio State hump. They got over that Big Ten championship drought and did it in dominating fashion. Kudos to them for making a playoff. Um, I just think they have more questions than Ohio State does. I know they obviously lost both bookend defensive ends with Hutchinson and Ojabo. You know, you lose Dax Hill, you lose Ross, you lose your defensive coordinator. You feel like they should take a bit of a step back. Hassan Haskins was extremely underrated. I know Blake Corm is super talented and so is Donovan Edwards, but anytime you needed two yards, anytime you needed a yard, anytime you needed three yards, you could hand it to Haskins he was going to get the first down. He was going to get in the end zone. He was going to move the chains. That's gone. And again, those two, the, the other two backs are you know more dynamic. But if you need a yard or two in the way that Harbaugh likes to play, I just wonder will that same success carry over. I do think that offense will be explosive. I think it'll be enough to win 10 games. Uh, they should be really good again, especially with that non-conference schedule being as bad as it is. Uh, they get... I know they're at Iowa, but they get Michigan State, Penn State at home. You figure if you can win, you know, one of those, maybe two of those, you're right back in the mix for competing for the East. But Ohio State, I think, is just the clear favorite. You already mentioned CJ Shroud. I'd say they have two hiding favorites because I think the best receiver in the country is Jackson Smith and Jigba. Mm -hmm. We saw, and I, I thought he was last year where they had Wilson and Alave, and they even said, this dude is different. Right. And, like, I think you're going to see that even more so this year. Travion Henderson's back another year. They have that bad taste in their mouth, and you could tell Ryan Day wholesale changes on that defense. After just one bad year, like, they didn't wait around, like, oh, we'll try to fix stuff in the offseason. Said, no, guys are reading guys out of here. We're bringing in a new defensive coordinator, Jim Knowles from Oklahoma State. We're going to switch some things around. Ryan Day, one conference loss since he's been there. I, I can't go against it. I think they're too talented, too loaded. Um, Michigan State, Penn State, I think, are both interesting, both volatile. I think because both quarterbacks are pretty volatile. Like, I like if that. You get really, I like that descriptor. If you get really good Sean Clifford, Penn State's going to win a lot of games. If you get meh Sean Clifford, you kind of get seven wins, eight wins. Peyton Thorne kind of needs to be his team now. There is no K-9. Now, I know that they kind of reloaded a little bit in the backfield. They got Jalen Berger from Wisconsin. They got Jared Groussard from Colorado. He was 2020 Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year. So you got those two guys are running back. But Kenneth Walker was special. He was generational. You can't just replace that. So I feel like it's going to be on Peyton Thorne to play really well. And from game to game, sometimes from quarter to quarter, you didn't really know what you're gonna get. When he was good, he was really good. But when he was in a slump, like as we saw in the Nebraska game, as we saw in the Indiana game, they had a hard time moving the football. 
So I think they could both be really good, but it's going to be very dependent on the quarterbacks. Um, as for the West, I really like Purdue. Oh, I yeah. really like Purdue. I think Aiden O'Connell, knowing it's his team, none, none of the quarterback carousel stuff from series to series and game to game, I think you get him. Interestingly enough, they got a couple of Iowa receivers coming over in Tyrone Tracy and Jones. Charlie Jones. Yeah. Um, Brock Tracy's Thompson. there too? Yep. How did I miss that? Yeah, he transferred much earlier. I know okay. Jones I must was just very like, recent. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, the fact that they it's got those. It's a story two, there. They just got a little a mole on the inside. Good, and good question. Like, interesting. I don't know. But I definitely thought it was interesting that you had two guys yeah. at the same position huh. coming over uh, to division rivals. So that Purdue Iowa game would be a lot yeah. of fun. A yeah. lot of fun. Uh, it's in West Lafayette, though, so it won't be as fun yeah. if they were going to Iowa City, but still. Um, yeah, I think Purdue's going to be really good. Um, Wisconsin, I feel like, always gets the headlines, but I just need to see more from Graham Mertz before I fully believe. I think the defense will still be great as usual, but offense kind of held them back. Um, he needs to improve for them, I think, to get back to the championship game. Uh, Iowa's still going to be Iowa. You know, they return a bunch in production. I know they lose Linderbaum, but, you know, most of that team is still back, so they should still be really good. Um, Nebraska. Nebraska, yes. So, <laughs> Nebraska's interesting because they lost nine games all by single digits. It's never happened. Never happened before. They went one and eight in conference, and they had an even point differential with eight losses like they had the most Hard outlier season of all time yeah like statistically of all time and no more adrian martinez so you just kind of wonder what they're gonna look like i know people are really high on them but i can't get out of my head that they're five and 20 in one possession games under scott frost and that's not just one mistake here one mistake there it's you know, special teams costing them games. Cascade. Yeah, whether it's you know special teams in Michigan State, Oklahoma losses, whether it's offensive line problems against Iowa, whether it's Martinez turning the ball over against Michigan, they just kind of seem to always find a way to not pull it out. And so until I see them do that, it's hard for me to trust them to be a contender. But I think the talent is there if they can figure some things out at quarterback. Minnesota? It's the team that has had, I feel like, a couple of cracks at winning the West since Fleck has been there. Like, just saying that, too. Like, they were always, you know, five to seven wins, like, count on it. And with a couple seasons where, you know, they broke through even higher. But, like, I think we got to appreciate, too, where Fleck has gotten them, you know, to the point where they are contending for appearances in, in Indy, at least. Like, can't, can't forget them. I don't, I don't really know. Oh, I definitely don't. I mean, I yeah, I know. I'm I know, just rambling too long. I, I know. I know. <laughs> I can't expect, you know, I, I literally had you, I basically said break down the whole conference, go. So definitely not your fault, but I, I just want to oh, get your I, thoughts I can wax on. poetic about the yeah. Gopes. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, you, I'm, I'm you, a boat guy. Yeah, what I, do you think? I like the, I like the Gopes. Yeah. Um, I think getting Kirk Sharaka back as offensive coordinator is absolutely huge for them. Tanner Morgan was kind of in the wilderness for the last two years. And he had his best year when Kirk Sharaka was calling the plays. And now that he's back, I think there's potential for them to be good again. I'm a little worried about the offensive line. It's a position that he's recruited well, and they have multiple guys drafted this year. I just don't know what the depth looks like in June behind them. Now, in August, faces could emerge, and it could be guys that are ready to go. And you're like, oh, man, like, okay, they're going to be legit. Um, they still got a couple guys that are good, but, you know, it used to just be like a full massive line all across the board. And I don't know if the depth is quite there yet for them to be a contender. If it is, I think they could be really good. Um, you know, obviously, you got to replace Mafe on defense. You know, we'll see what that looks like. But, you know, Flex hit the portal. He's got some guys coming in uh, on defense from the portal. So. Uh, Minnesota, you know, I mean, we saw it last year. It, you know, I had to come up with four-way tie scenarios and, you know, going into the final week of the year. And, you know, if Nebraska beats Iowa on Black Friday, like Minnesota would have won the West. Like, they, they were that close to doing it. And so with no dominant team, I don't see why the Ghosts can't be in the mix again. All right. Well said, H. I know we uh, 
sat down. We're kind of like, yeah, it's June. What are we going to talk about? Almost 45 minutes right there, just kind of <laughs> ripping. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a layup for us. So um, appreciate you jumping in. Glad we could finally, you know, break in the new studio a little bit. Hopefully much more to come. And um, I don't know, anything else before we sign out for uh, episode, I don't even know, like 100-something, <laughs> but episode one in the new home? I like the new digs. I really do. I'm looking forward to uh, getting comfortable with them. I'm looking forward to getting a little bit more in the background for me, get some more Michigan State stuff, maybe get a, a tuck coming shirt or something like that. Yeah. You know, we're going to... Uh, Call up some friends, man, at the athletic office. I mean, I, I got some, probably more than most places at, at Michigan State, but, uh, you know, we need to send some swag in. I need to, like a running competition between the schools, like who can send the most gear in here and start, start repping their schools. Because, like, if you send it, We'll show it off. Yeah, absolutely. I gotta, I gotta get on the horn with uh, Ben Flieger. See if he can hook me up with a few things. Sounds good. All right, H. Till next time. Uh, enjoy your summer, um, and hopefully we'll talk soon. All right, sounds good, man. All right, thanks once again to Harold and Nick for joining the show. Great to be back behind the mic. Great to be back talking Big Ten sports. And uh, another reason, we kind of pause the the show in the spring. Uh, was one of our producers actually left. I. I uh, recorded a tribute to her on the last episode we did, I think back in late February. Julie Bronder, who edited most, if not all, of these podcasts. She has moved on and is living her best life in Spain. And we have a new podcast producer and editor on, uh, on the show now. So shout out to Haley Luke for putting this together. Uh, first of many, I hope. And appreciate her for, uh, for chopping it up with us. So since it is summer, uh, it'll still be pretty slow cadence of podcasts till things ramp back up but I'm sure we'll talk to you quite soon and until we do take care enjoy the summer big 10 off season and get ready because football's right around the corner we will talk to you uh, very soon hopefully here on the take 10 podcast